Hey, hi there, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming along to uh, the presentation here today. Uh, project manager war stories and tales from the trenches. Uh, as we all know, uh, project managers are a very important part of getting any um, project out. They're uh, sort of crucial to the success of any uh, particular project. Uh, they really act as the linchpins of um, a, a, a web project because they've got to connect various uh, parties, such as the, the product owners, the stakeholders, as well as members on their own team, such as developers and solution architects and designers. They've got to be great at mediation, communication, basically juggling the balls and, and keeping the whole show on the road. They've also got to take responsibility for the delivery of the, the project, and that means um, being responsible for the success for the client, the project has actually got to be delivered and, uh, the, uh, and the client basically be happy with what they've received. Also, their employer has got to uh, you know, see the project as a success in terms of uh, you know, financial things and that the, uh, the team as well should have enjoyed the, uh, working on the project as well. How do they sort of navigate all of these uh, sort of competing uh, claims? It really does come down to experience. It's not just a matter of uh, book knowledge. Uh, a lot of it is about yeah, being in the trenches and having been there and done that and taking the lessons learned and applying it uh, for the next job. So here we are today. Uh, we've got six project managers um, that have been, we found from uh, various Drupal web shops in Australia when I was, uh, and New Zealand. When I was putting this uh, talk on, I basically emailed out to everyone I, I knew, and uh, six uh, intrepid project managers have stepped up to uh, share their um, sort of hard-won knowledge with you. So what we're going to see is uh, six lightning talks, uh, five minutes each from each of the, the project managers, and then we're going to have some uh, question and answers, you know, at the end. So, you know, I encourage you to, to ask all the, uh, the curly questions uh, you like of them once they're finished. Uh, these are the people uh, we've got. We've got Mara Milani. She's the, uh, the owner of Marameo uh, Designs. We've got Andrew Bogue, who's the, the general manager of Catalyst. Peter Moulding, who is uh, a consultant. We've got Ahmed Darby, who is a, a client service manager from Technocrat. Lucas Hodge, uh, the owner of, from Media Insights. And Daniel Richardson, uh, client service manager from uh, Previous Next. So basically, these guys are all going to serve up uh, a bit of an assortment of uh, little tips and tricks and uh, all that hard-won knowledge. So I'll get off the stage and uh, I'll introduce uh, Mara now to, uh, to take care of proceedings. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Mara Milani and I'm the owner of Mara Milani Design. Um, we help um, um, small to medium businesses to uh, create, develop, and grow their digital online presence. Uh, we've been working for, uh, with Drupal for about uh, five years, and it's been an amazing ride so far. Um, what I'm going to do um, today is I'm just going to speak about a bit of the coding process that comes into a project. And um, I'm not sure about you guys, but every time I have to quote for a project, I feel uh, a little bit uh, of uh, a combination of a 007, a mind reader, and a counselor at the same time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's also quite um, uh, crazy and insane the amount of uh, time and effort that which usually is unpaid that goes into quoting all the time. So what I'm going to be doing is just trying to focus on minimizing this effort uh, without uh, pulling just a number out of a hat. Um, I'm just going to share um, our approach on quoting, and uh, that it's uh, by no means uh, like a magic recipe, but that's what we do and it's working for us. Um, so what we do is that we have a, just a simple Google uh, spreadsheet, and um, so we just uh, uh, completely break down the project in uh, user stories, as you do, and um, we assign a difficulty of one to five for every user stories. There is a really simple calculation going on here where depending on how many hours we think it's gonna take to complete the user story, we're gonna have like a low range and a high range. So it goes to from about uh, by 0.8 to by two, depending on the difficulties. So something like, for example, creating a content type, uh, it would be difficulty one. Uh, something, uh, for example, like uh, functionality, 
uh, that requires a module that we never used before and perhaps has a very big uh, um, issue queues with bugs in it, it would be a difficulty five. Uh, that, of course, gives us uh, um, an estimate range, and uh, we add project management on top of it, and it's all good. Now, um, you can also find this uh, um, quoting uh, um, spreadsheet uh, in marmadesign.com slash quoting. So if you want to grab it and have a look at it, uh, feel free. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, um, the quoting exercise, I consider it to be a trusting exercise with the client. Um, most times um, when you quote on a project, um, the clients come from a referral or come from a website lead, uh, which means that the, they don't really know you. And uh, sending something like that through, um, it really sets um, the base for a transparent um, uh, approach and, and relationship that you're going to set with your clients. And um, in, in, in our uh, case, uh, this works um, pretty well, and we don't really have any issue with that. Uh, sometimes uh, it happens that they just say, well, but we need a fixed price. Uh, we, can't, we can't go on a flexible quote. Um, what we do uh, is we really try to educate them and explain that uh, a flexible quote most times is actually cheaper at the end for them. Um, but if you really, really need a fixed quote, what we do is just we get the higher end of the estimate and we add a 15% on top, which is the risk factor uh, for us. Um, of course, there are uh, things that you can do to minimize that risk. Um, and the first one uh, it would be to start with the right strategy uh, from the beginning, especially ask heaps of questions and um, uh, do a lot of research. But more than anything, uh, um, I think it's more like um, uh, getting to understand what requirement hasn't been asked in that project. Because a lot of the time, it's not what the client asks you to do, it's what they don't ask you to do that you really need to try to find out in order not to get in trouble later. Um, prototyping uh, is something that I found really, really important. Um, a lot of people say, oh yeah, but it's take time and time is money. Um, really is not. Uh, you can even do something very simple like a sketch on a piece of paper and the visual, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the visual um, deliver that you do to the client, uh, it really helps for them to understand uh, that you, un you really got what they want and uh, it gets out of the way a lot of problems later. So it really isn't, it saves you money at the end. Um, and agile development, of course, um, keep really short sprints and reviews all the time. It really helps generally to minimize the risk during the actual uh, project. Now, this is by no means again like a, a, a recipe, a magic recipe, but, um, and I really like to know how you guys do it and uh, just to share um, this kind of conversation with you because I'm quite interested in uh, this specific topic. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Andrew Bogue. I'm the Managing Director of Catalyst IT here in Australia. Uh, over the years, I've sort of uh, had a number of roles in the Drupal space, uh, from once upon a time, a long time ago, being a developer, to being a uh, account manager, to uh, even solutions architecture, and also general project management. And that's where I sort of come from in this particular talk, is uh, some thoughts around how to, uh, you know, some thoughts that I hope will be useful in order to deliver, um, you know, have a successful outcome and, and, and that sort of component of project management, which as, as Murray well said, project managers do a whole lot of things, uh, but I think ultimately they're about an, a successful outcome for the client and for yourself. So one of the important things with, you know, project management in this sort of scenario of Drupal is this whole idea of really getting Drupal, right? Uh, so we're an organisation that we don't only do Drupal development, um, we also do other things, we're all about open source software, but there are times when, you know, we will actually assess a project as to whether or not Drupal is the best fit, and, you know, you need to understand what Drupal is good at, uh, and, what it, what, and where it's going to make your life harder, or where it might not be ideal. Uh, one of the examples recently is we looked at Drupal for, for a project, and it wasn't actually, we weren't actually doing any content management, 
So there wasn't really much content, and yet, you know, Drupal is a content management system, and yes, we could have used a lot of the bits of Drupal to solve some problems, but it started making the idea of using a framework a little bit more appealing, right? So um, you, you want to be able to understand what Drupal is good at and how it's going to make your life easier and wh where it is a useful instrument in your toolbox. And that's the thing that uh, if you sort of use it for the wrong thing, then, or, or, you, or you use it for something that it might, there might be a better way of doing it, then, you know, that, that isn't necessarily the best start for a project. So another thing that we think is really important is, is sort of the structure around a project, right? Now, obviously, it depends on the size of a project as to whether or not you have all these people available to you, but they each have a really important role, and the project management should keep them all on the same page. But, you know, you need um, account management. You need someone keep making sure that the process is going, you know, according to plan and that the client is broadly happy and that the client is up to date with what's going on and that the client is aware of which decisions are pending and, you know, what, what we might need from then. Uh, you need technical leadership. Uh, it really does show, once things start getting a bit tricky, um, if there isn't the right flavour of technical leadership. Technical leadership also allows you to keep um, people on the same track technically conceivably because there's always more than one way of doing things from a technical point of view. Even with Drupal that you know tries to standardise a lot of these things, there's always one, more than one way. There's always a number of, you know, there's always someone wants to do it this way and someone wants to do it this way. And, you know, technical leadership at the very least means someone gets to make a decision. And, you know, that decision is based on their experience uh, and they and they see it as a, as, as, an out, as a sort of net gain for the project and they realise that, you know, we have to make a call here and that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, Drupal developers you need good Drupal developers. That's a, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. Um, and if you have them on a project, that can be the difference between something taking one week and something taking six weeks. Uh, you know, DevOps, as it gets thrown around, operation support, depending on the no nature of the project, it really is good to have someone who understands about how to set things, you know, how to architect things well. Uh, that's very relevant if you're doing something that involves some systems integration, conceivably, or, you know, you have some particular requirements around high availability or, or these sorts of things. You know, using junior devs is, is a great thing. It's good for the community, it's good for your company, it's, it's good for the universe. Uh, but making sure that that mentoring process is done properly and that you're supporting them and developing them and not just throwing them in the deep end and then watching them drown and then saying, well, that didn't work very well, you know. But you've got to invest in them, and that's, that needs to be part of your... If, if you've got the capacity for it, that needs to be done well. And we've, we've actually learned a lot about how to not do it. <laughs> We're getting better. Um, and, you know, obviously, part of the team structure of a successful Drupal outcome is a client who also gets Drupal, and who also understands what it brings, and who also understands what what you should do with it and what you shouldn't do it and how you need to work with it. And, you know, one of the challenges is clients who want admin access on a Drupal site who just shouldn't have it because they just shouldn't have it because they, they don't understand that there's someone can click around and really break everything and then they want to complain that it's someone else's fault, you know, and it's this whole, but they sort of say it's my site. And I go, well, yeah, it is, but you don't understand how to use these things, you know. So, so it's an interesting one and you really want the... You know, putting access control in place can be painful and, you know, sometimes causes as many problems as it solves, but they need to get it, right? They need to understand that they're, Drupal brings certain things to the table. Um, another thing that we've, that is an ongoing challenge is this whole idea in the Drupal world of, you know, when to build and when to use and when to extend, you know? Um, there, are, there are certainly, I've heard some criticism out there from the, in the market, uh, actually, from some people who, some clients who've said that there are, you know, there are Drupal sort of developers out there whose idea of, you know, developing is just to download modules from Drupal.org and install them, right? Now, that's a really, that's one of the pluses of Drupal is that you've got so much you can use, that, you know, that someone else has contributed and that's a great thing, but you do also, sometimes want to write code. You do want to write your own module and you do want to extend an existing module and you want to be able to make those decisions. Uh, you know, you want to maybe standardise a particular module as opposed to use two different ones. Um, you know, these are, these are things that if you get them wrong, you, you, you earn technical debt or you get a solution that, you know, isn't necessarily what you wanted to. And that's, a, that's an ongoing discussion. I mean, the use of features, for example, how you use features in your deployment processes and, and your, um, your code control, and sometimes they're a bit of a pain, but, you know, obviously they have real, real uses. Um, certainly, you need to be able, in my mind, you know, you need to be able to write modules, you know. You need to be able to do smart things with the tool sets that Drupal provides you with the APIs. That's what Drupal was built for. It was built to be extended, right? So getting that right is, is a core part of a successful uh, Drupal outcome. You know, the big picture as well. As much as, 
as much as many Drupal projects are really like a build and deliver, um, you know, you, you can and should be thinking about what's in the future. You know, you don't want to just deliver and run away because, that, you know, a great source of work for us is always our existing clients. You know, we, want, we don't want just transactional relationships with our clients. We want to do a piece of work and then another piece of work, right? You know, that, and that's, that's, that's the easiest way to get more work is from people who already know you and who like you and understand you. And, we, and that's why you sort of to some degree need to be thinking about, you know, the tidiness of your solution, the maintainability of your solution, you know, you know, the dirty word of upgrades and all these sorts of things. But, you know, trying to really factor in as much as is feasible uh, in the solution that you're delivering. A, a great example there is if you're really going to be handing this over to your client to manage and run and potentially work on, then have a think about what they're going to need to be able to do that well. It's no good to say, well, you know, we did it, here's the version control, here's a, you know, here's a two-page document, you know, you don't want to pass anymore, so you can, you can handle it, right? Like, there are other things you can do, such as mandated communication periods, and you can, you can, you can build this into the project. Mandated um, communication exchange workshops, uh, potentially a couple of events together where they're going to make some changes and this is going to go all the way through to uh, a release cycle and things like that, which is going to increase the level of comfort in that particular case. So, you know, if you can, it, it is about, it's a, it's a long game as well as it's a short game, um, and and this going well, you get more work, which is another successful thing for everyone. Uh, that's us. That's us. Good afternoon. When I walked in here this morning, I was sorely tempted to go into the toy conference next door. But I thought Angie's presentation on Drupal 8 found more fun. I love Drupal, I love PHP, I don't like corporate politics. And I'm going to show you one example. Corporate politics doing more damage than the worst coder I've ever come across. Okay, PHP site. We're going to convert to Drupal. PHP site, we're going to convert to Drupal. The site I've described as CRUD, created by many developers, all using their own little personal ways of doing things. It was unreadable code. None of the developers wrote code to be read by anybody else. A lot of the updates were done by someone taking a piece of code copying it across. So if you had a particular field had some weird code around it and it was used in 12 places, they'd fix it in one place and they'd copy it to another nine places. And we'd, we'd have to find the ones they missed. And it was worth deleting, that was about it. All right, so the politics stepped in. The, the boss, bosses were battling to control the project, to make it their own personal little project. And they were mostly salespeople. How do you know when salespeople are lying? Their lips are moving. So they had this little application, a niche application in a small market. I showed them how be international, multilingual, multi-currency, and it could break out of their little niche market. It, could, it would have been an Airbnb. Five years ago, they would have had an Airbnb running as a website, and all they needed to do was put an app on the front. They chopped and changed the project so much that it dribbled away. So if you want to look up exsanguation, it's a technical term for what management did through politics to the project. So the story that they presented when they asked for someone to fix their site, enhance it, might give a better theming and so on. One application sitting in a website. One professional development team did it. And there was a couple of trivial errors to fix before we got on to improving the theming and navigation and so on. The truth. There were two completely unrelated applications written by completely different contracting companies. Both applications have been hacked to death by multiple contractors who'd come in, made changes, hated the work environment, 
height of the code, gave up and walked out. Uh, none of the errors were trivial. They were all non-trivial and there were just this endless run of them. And mostly programmers had decided to just add their little bit on the end of the previous code, making this great big long bit of spaghetti code. got management lying about, oh, it's really easy, it's quick, we only want this little stuff. The, you've really got to get to know the people you're going to work for, check them out, find out who's worked with them before, go and talk to their customers, and when you talk to the customers you might find out there are heaps of problems, not just a few. Find out about their financial situation. So you're going to quote 50 grand for a project, and they've only got 10 grand in the bank, and they're spending of their $5,000 a week income, they're spending $6,000 a week. So they're going down the gurgler before they'll ever pay you. And look at the code. Go in there for free. Three days, five days, fix their first problem, see what it's like. If, if you haven't seen the code in the database, don't go for a fixed price or even a 50% a overhead. I'd be doing a 300% overhead. Uh, and then don't commit to six months. So look, we do this little problem, commit to that and you pay at the end. So, in the building industry, that's progress payments. Big thing. Get a weekly progress payment, and if they don't pay within a certain number of days, walk away. So, start again when you catch up on your progress payments. This, um, the conversion to Drupal is supposed to be two days a week fixing problems, three days a week doing the conversion, we'd end up four days a week fixing problems, one day a week starting the conversion, then the next week we do four days fixing problems which would change the database to code and we'd have to restart the conversion, so the conversion never happened. So the final requirement I would have put in is a separate team for the conversion, the conversion goes ahead completely independent because it's so, it would be so much easier to fix everything change the theme and do everything else after the conversion. Can you guys hear me at the back? Yep. All right. Hello. Um, so, I guess the purpose of this presentation is to talk about war stories. Um, but let's start by reviewing every project manager's idea of utopia. We have a starting point, a destination. We have a budget to finance us throughout the journey, a scope to guide us along. Um, but I think anyone and everyone who's worked in the industry knows that a lot of the time it's supposed to look something like this was supposed to be a picture of a globe and sort of going around the world to get, you know, from your, from your initial point to your destination. Not sure what happened there. Um, but anyway, you can imagine. Um, and when you ask the question why, you often get a whole bunch of externalizing excuses and reasons. Um, it was the client's fault, this person's fault, that person's fault. And, and generally speaking, you can abstract these excuses and reasons and, and genuine facts into two broad groups. Client inflicted and self inflicted. Um, and I guess the purpose of my talk today is to share with you two more stories um, that are the result of self-inflicted issues and things that I'm sure a lot of you here see in day-to-day -day project manage uh, management. And the general theme is one to do with um, over-promising and under-delivering and expectation management more broadly. Um, and so the first, the first talking point is really to do with goal planning. And I actually have a story that I'd like to share from a previous um, experience. Um, and, and this is actually a real, a, a real case. 
basically the abstraction of the client's requirements were, was to migrate a website from its current CMS over to Drupal. A couple of things to bear in mind, this website uh, was not responsive, so it was just a basic desktop website. Um, and also the client had a hard deadline, a hard deadline they had to work towards. Beyond that, they'd incur extremely hefty hosting fees, and you know, even worse, they'd probably have to double up on their hosting fees, so the old environment and the new one. Um, at the kickoff meeting, and I, I've seen this personally, um, everyone's sort of quite excited and euphoric about this project, and hey, let's do this instead. Heck, why not use uh, uh, Drupal's base responsive theme, and all of a sudden, you know, you get three websites for the price of one, your desktop, tablet, and mobile. Um, and you know, the client was quite excited at that point. They thought it was an amazing idea, why not? Um, everyone was on, was on board this journey. <sighs> but then, you know, a few months pass and all of a sudden we're two months late. Two months late. So it's two months of um, hosting fees, at the bare minimum, the clients had to incur because of the delays. Obviously these things take time. The client's not thinking about them on day one of the project. Everyone's in love with each other, right? Um, and then the other thing also was what made things worse was when the client's looking at this and saying, hey, the, 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 the tablet and the mobile version of the website don't reflect our brand. And what's worse, um, and, and I'm sure there's a few technical people you know, in this audience, was that the grid system isn't working properly. And that's not a simple matter of just switching out from one grid system for another. Um, and then the project manager chirps in and says, oh, hey, by the way, um, if you look at the original requirements, we weren't expected to migrate this across um, in a responsive manner. Uh, so then the question is, okay, so are you going to sort of unmigrate and put it back to a one for one? And do you know also know that's not an easy job to do either? Um, and what's worse, and I think this is something that I'd really like to talk to you guys a bit more during the Q&A Q &A forum, is that the UAT backlog of issues all of a sudden triples, if not quadruples, because in the original scope, you've only had to deal with one list of issues to do with the desktop to desktop migration. But now we have issues with desktop, tablet, and bloody mobile, right? <laughs> um, and so what you end up with is, is an extremely unhappy client. Extremely unhappy client. The second, the second uh, um, sort of, I guess, war story I'd like to share is one to do with this, this comment. I hear it over and over again, and I'm sure a lot of you guys hear the same thing too. Yeah, it'll just take us two hours, right? Um, so you're a project manager delivering a project, plowing ahead, and the client, client comes along one day to stand up and says, hey, we have a change. Right? And before you open your mouth, and, look, and sadly sometimes it's the project manager themselves, hey, yeah, we can do it for you in two hours. Yeah, we'll just take us a couple of hours and, and we'll be fine. The client's really excited. They think, hey, you know, I thought this was going to cost me 10 grand. It's going to cost me just a couple hundred bucks. But a week passes. Right? And then we're sitting around the table with the client, and the client's saying, hey, what happened there? And then you have people coming and saying, oh, I didn't realize you were going to hold us literally to this requirement or you know, you know, you know all, all these dependencies and this and that and the other and the project manager is sitting there breaking the sweat literally right um, and then at the end of the day when the PM has their PMO call blames it all on developers um, and, and you know sadly this happens more often than, 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 than we'd like to think um, and I'd really like to leave sort of discussion, discussing solutions with you guys and I'm actually interested in learning from you as much as I am interested in sharing some of my ideas around around these issues. Um, but that's basically it for me. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Lucas Hodge and I'm the um, director at Media Insight. So um, the, I want to share today, um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the art of war and um, I suppose my philosophies and my approaches to project management that I've, I've used over the last 10 years, I suppose, with um, working with universities, governments, and other organizations. Um, so basically, this is what I'm trying to avoid. Um, this is like an um, artist's depiction of a, of a meeting, and um, there's a, a few of the, um, you know, characters involved in here. Um, there's generally been five characters that I've um, dealt with, with um, working in um, the projects that I've been involved with. So there's, yeah, designers, developers, um, there's executives, there's the site moderators or site maintainers, and um, also freelancers. So, um, so yeah, as a, as a project manager, you're um, an expert of dealing with conflict and trying to resolve it. There's always going to be different expectations. Um, 
competing personalities, um, different needs, goals, values, etc. Whether they're personal or whether they're connected to the company or the organisation involved. So, yeah, basically we're all human, and um, conflict's pretty easy. Um, but as a as a project manager, I'm my primary goal or my pr primary aim is to um, achieve victory without battle. Basically, so it's trying to uh, not create a battle in the first place uh, by by sort of noticing small things before they become problems. I'm able to uh, deal with things, um, plan for difficulty while it's still easy. So that means I can um, get the most done with the least amount of effort. So that's that's the mindset that I'm trying to take in as a project manager to avoid the battles. But yeah, I've failed lots of times, and I'm by no no means a master of this yet. It's just my my goal. Um, so I think as a project manager, uh, some of the traits like, um, yeah, you need to have authority and trust from your, the people that you're working with. They need to be able to trust your um, viewpoints. You need to harmonize a lot of different viewpoints. You need to pre-comprehend sometimes things before they happen um, as much as possible and translate between business speak, code and um, yeah, type fonts and whatever it might be. So you've got to sort of translate between the different camps. Sometimes that means you're going back and forth between the camps and, you know, they want this thing and they want that thing and then you've got to mediate it. So um, consensus is also good as well. I found that by trying to get consensus decisions, you can get away with a lot of documentation and legal contracts. So the more consensus, the better. And the more knowledge that I have across the multiple spaces, the more I'm able to have a meaningful conversation with people as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to share a few things with like how I've dealt with some of them. Um, with designers, definitely good to specify constraints. Otherwise, you can end up with them getting carried away, trying to design the most amazing thing, and you try and build it, and it's not going to really solve the, the client's needs or the user's needs. Um, modifications are always are going to happen, so try and pre-warn them that you know their fancy designs may change once it gets to the developers. Um, and I found don't let them see work in progress. Let the let the developers actually finish stuff before showing them. Um, yeah, developers, you kind of want to have good plans before bothering them because um, they they want good specifications um, and they don't like things being changed. If you come back and go, oh, the, the plans have changed, they don't really like that. And you probably wouldn't like build a house without um, having plans first from an architect. So don't let don't let developers build projects before you've got plans in place. Uh, with executives, yeah, avoid details, but found that trying to make their staff look good is a good way as well. Obviously, they've employed their staff, so if, if you make their staff look good, then they feel like they've made a good decision and then they can avoid the details because they trust their staff. Um, and for fun, yeah, try and tell the bad news in a good way. Um, um, with site moderators, uh, these are probably the ones I deal with the most, so obviously trying to make everyone happy, but if you can make these guys happy and you can educate and empower them, then um, they're not going to bother your designers or your developers as much as well. They're not going to ask stupid questions. So um, eventually, you'll be their trusted advisor. Um, freelancers, pretty simple. Try and not get the try and um, only involve when necessary. And sometimes they might try and take your project on a tangent. But um, yeah, it's pretty simple. So, yep, that's my my key goal is just to try and avoid the problem in the first place. That works? Nice. I'm timing this, Murray. Alrighty. Um, I'm not going to share any war stories today. Those bodies are staying buried. Um, hopefully where people can't find them. But I am going to give you five tips that I've picked up over the years doing project management um, with previous Next and with other agencies, other companies. I know I've got five tips and five minutes, so I'm going to crack straight into it. Tip one, why are we here again? It's a deep existential question, really quite deep, much too deep for a Thursday afternoon. Um, basically, this tip is about making sure that you know the organizational context of the project that you're working on. 
So I'm sure we've all sat in kickoff meetings, basically sitting there, everyone sitting around saying, okay, we've got to build this really awesome Drupal site. How are we going to do it? What I'm talking about here is taking a step backwards and just sort of thinking, okay, why, why are we using Drupal? As we know from, from our experiences, some organizations have Drupal thrust upon them. Some organizations choose Drupal. Um, some of them make a decision by default. And what I'm really kind of getting at here is just take a step back, look at the client, look at the organizational context. Tip two, communication. Everyone loves communication. Everyone loves planning. All project managers love planning. Um, and to plan effectively, you need to communicate. And that means communicating, obviously, with your internal teams, with your client, um, with whoever it may be, whoever's involved in the project, just communicate. Um, but there's one caveat here. Communication takes a lot of time. So what you really need to do is at the start of a project, make sure the team is aware of all the communication channels you're going to be using, whether that's Skype, IRC, Redmine, Jira, whatever you use, just make sure the whole team is on the same page. And also, quickly identify the person that likes to talk. Every project has one. Um, sometimes it's the client, sometimes it's not. Um, and just keep an eye on them because every meeting that person calls, every hour they spend sitting in IRC will be hours logged to your project. So just keep an eye on that one. Um, but yeah, that's not to say don't communicate because communication is vital. Tip three, why do developers think documentation is evil or my struggle with organic groups? Um, yeah, so the Agile Manifesto has a lot to answer for, in my opinion, just my opinion. Um, documentation is very, very valuable, especially if you're working on projects with multiple developers or um, with multiple different clients, multiple different project managers. Um, so the organic groups part of this tip, this is a little bit of a war story. We recently built an intranet for a client. Um, it had a huge organic groups component. Organic groups is a bit of a beast, as I'm sure some of you know. Um, and what happened with this particular site that we built was that there was a little piece of configuration that wasn't quite right. So this was raised as a bug. Um, I went in to try and sort of triage this bug. Couldn't do it, spent a couple of hours looking at it. Had to assign it to another developer. Now this developer was a really good developer, but he hadn't particularly used organic groups before, hadn't been involved in the project. So this particular very small bug ended up taking around six or seven hours. And the worst thing was, did a bit of Googling. First thing I did actually was a bit of Googling, found this issue, pasted it into the issue tracker. But I couldn't quite understand the thrust of this issue. But it turns out, the very first thing I found and the very first link I posted was the actual solution. I just didn't know it. Um, and that's because the way it was written in the issue wasn't in human language. It was pretty developer-centric. So anyway, just a little story. This tip will blow your mind. It really will. Tip number four, best tip. Developers are not your slaves. As a project manager, you might like to think they are your slaves. They're not. They're actually human beings, believe it or not. You know, they stay up late, they live in the dark, but still developers, you know, human beings. Best thing you can do to a developer, be their shoulder to cry on. When they want to complain, listen. Take them for a beer. Let them just empty it out. Let them cry it out to you. Because if you don't listen to it, Chances are the client will, and you don't want that. It doesn't make you look very good. It's not that mind blowing, common sense. Tip five um, what to do if it goes wrong? I don't know, you guys are on your own there. That's, that's pretty tough. I don't know, it does go wrong. 
with all the will in the world, start of a project, you know, you've got the uh, rainbows, unicorns, bunnies, everyone's happy, it's all donuts and coffee, it's all good. It can go wrong. What's the best thing you can do if you can't commit ritual suicide? Um, I guess don't lie to the client, be upfront, be honest. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. tips in there. So, uh, hey everyone, let's just thank all our six speakers while they're all up there. Thanks guys. Really good stuff. Now, do we, do we have a fixed microphone here for, for questions from the audience? I don't think so. Maybe, yeah, we'll just share one of these mics down into the audience. Is there anyone out there who'd like to ask some questions of the uh, speakers today? I suppose that was just a reference to um, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Uh, I just threw that one in there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, I suppose it's just with the executives, you probably just want to... Um, sometimes you have to tell them bad news. So, um, yeah, just try and do it in a good way. I, I, I can't explain. Look, it's, it's absolutely a tough one. And if, if I could share a real sort of example, um, a project I was referring to for, for a very large um, government organisation, um, you know, we initially set out this expectation, um, well, not us as technocrat, but uh, th this organisation that I worked for, we set the expectation that we'd migrate these websites over in a responsive fashion, right? Um, and there were actually five of these websites we had to migrate. And, uh, you know, the, the first two we... we you know, the first one we migrated to blow out the timelines. The second one blew out the timelines again. And, and the third, and, and the interesting thing about these five projects were they were for five different business units. So the third business unit came along and I think by then the team had learned their lesson, right? Um, the issue though was we had to communicate to this separate business unit that they weren't going to get a responsive migration. And you can imagine the look on their faces. Um, and, and so the, the way sort of I guess I was able to sell. I actually, I was actually in the tough position where I had to step in and support the manager, the PM throughout that was to actually say, "Hey, we're actually doing this for your sake. Yes, you're not going to get a responsive migration, but it does mean your timelines are saved. Um, you know, you're not going to have to incur sort of double the hosting expenses. There's always, there's always something in it for the for the counterpart. The issue of negotiations is when you go in and think, you know, it's us versus them. You always need to put yourself in the client's shoes and think about how can I somehow frame this." To, to suit their own needs. And, and yes, it was still, I'm not gonna pretend you know, that they walked away sort of you know, loving life, but they understood and, that, and, and they saw the risk that they were going to face and, and the problems they were going to incur if, we did, you know, if this went on and on and on. So, so that, that might be one example of how you sort of frame something in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit more of a positive light to your client. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time really quickly, which really sucks. But uh, is there any other other people out there with, with questions? I have one more thing very quickly on the um, bad news thing. Uh, one thing to bear in mind about bad news is uh, don't run from it. And the actual reception to this from a client is much, well, is better, although it's still bad, if you're the one telling them as opposed to if they're the ones confronting you with this news. So, you know, the sooner you get onto it and, like, have that uncomfortable discussion, you might actually get some mileage, especially if you're talking to the manager. If, he, if that person gets ambushed by their own team and says, it's all broken, it's all bad, blah, 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 and then calls you angrily, th there's a big difference if you've already called that person and said, there's some problems, you should be aware of this, just in terms of the, you know, the perception and the expectations and the general happiness of the, the outcome. Just um, quickly, can each one of you comment on what would be your preferred project management tool of choice? Um, I usually use Trello um, as a project management tool, and uh, I actually found out uh, recently there is a great extension, it's called the Trello Plus, and it's great for agile development. It gets you track estimates and the track time within Trello, and it's just a Chrome extension and it's free, so that's, that's pretty good stuff there. For us, it's often which one the client wants to use, but Trello is good, Jira is good, 
red mine has its uses. Um, um, Geofragile, a principal toolbox for um, waterfall. Yeah, we use Trello as well. Yeah. Uh, we use Redmine, but out of choice, I'd use Excel. I like to roll old school. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for some really great information there. For a small company which is uh, graduating into a larger company and encountering all of these growth pains that you're sort of referencing here, um, I'd like to know, because I've had lots of competing views on this, how you feel about fixed quotes and when, if ever, they should be engaged in? Never. <laughs> but, but when you have to, when you have to, right? You just, some clients will not get it. They just look at you and go, but hey, you're the computer dude. What do you mean you don't know how long this takes to do? If I go to a car shop and I say change my tire, they know it's gonna take two hours. You know, so you just have to, and you have to mitigate that risk, and you have to put processes in place, and you have to keep talking to them about it, and you have to be ready to go to them and say, you've got to give us more money, or not, right? Like, and it's, it's a scary one. Of course, of course you can understand from their point of view why they want a fixed price. Of course you can. But, you know, sometimes it's, the, the challenge, obviously, is, is when they don't really know what they want, and when they don't really know what, you know, what, how they're going to change their mind. It just depends on the work. You Please know, repeat I mean, the question. Uh, sorry, uh, do we have the view that if, if it's not, if it's fixed price, fix, if it's not, or uh, well, if it's fixed price, don't take the work? Um, I mean, it just depends. I mean, the other option is you can, you can take pieces out. Um, you can do things incrementally. Um, you, there's some things you're going to be more comfortable doing as a fixed price quote. You start as a, you know, try and put things into MVP status, do proof of concepts, do pilots, use the word pilot, you know. Um, take pieces out and say this is this is time material because we don't know and you know have scoping bodies of work but once again you might still get to the end and write a big pretty document and all they do is open to the last page and look at the number so you know it's it's an it's an unfortunate reality uh, out there um, and to some degree you get to a point where you decide do I want this work or not and you've we've certainly been hugely burnt um, you know more often than not guess what it takes longer than you think you know, guess what? Whatever number you come up with, someone comes in, how long is that going to take? And I hear this, how many days? And I go, triple it. You know, and guess what? It took five times. You know, so. Yeah, so a lot of businesses will split a project up the way you'd split up a house. With, you pay an architect to design it and you pay a builder to build it, even if they're the same company. So what's wrong with saying, I'll come in for a week I'll write out the plan, charge you 10 grand or whatever, and then these are the next phases. This is how much, how long it'll take. Each one will take approximately this, and I'll give you a firm price after I do the first phase. So at the end of each phase, you give a firm price for the next phase. And if things turned out the way a certain project turned out that I was on, you might just walk away or you might double one of the later prices. Really short on time. I see Jam's got the mic in his hand there, but maybe just one last question. I think. Yeah, so it's, it's actually just a break. comment. Yep. Maybe that's more efficient. Um, yes. On the subject of positive communication in potentially negative situations, um, if you look at organizations that get fanatical customer loyalty, they're usually the ones when something goes wrong, they admit it and they work really, really hard with their customers to fix it. So if you actually stand up and say, I'm really sorry, we totally screwed this, but we're going to make it good no matter what. Um, if you, 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 you have that psychological effect of getting everybody on the same side of the table, um, that's often incredibly powerful. And I mean, not to say that you should try and screw up, but it's, it's, it's a way of getting positive outcomes out of potentially harmful situations. Agile talk. There's another panel this afternoon about how to sell Agile to your clients. So you should come to that. It's in the same room at 3:45. All right. Thanks, everyone. Let's uh, thank you guys. Again.